Energy Laboratory, and it will be focused on the integration of intermittent renewables and nuclear for Low Carbon Society, a joint study by MIT in Japan. Before we begin, I'll quickly go over some of the webinar features. Uh, for audio, you have two options. You may either listen through your computer or over your telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. If you choose to dial in by phone, please select the telephone option and a box on the right side will display the telephone number and audio pin you should use to dial in. If anyone is having technical difficulties with the webinar, you may contact the GoToWebinars help desk at 888-259-3826 for assistance with a U.S. country code. For some housekeeping items, if you would like to ask questions, we ask that you use the questions pane where you may type in your question. Also, the webinar, the recording of today's webinar, of today's presentation, will be added to YouTube as a link provided on this slide, and you're welcome to watch it at any time after it's posted, uh, after the presentation. Today's webinar agenda is centered around a presentation and panel discussion from our expert panelists on their recently released joint study on the challenges and opportunities facing nuclear. Before we launch into the presentation, I will provide a quick introduction of today's panelists. Uh, then we will have a quick introduction from Japan, um, some people at the Ministry of Economy, uh, Medi, Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry. Um, following the presentation, we will have a moderated discussion, and we will have a question and answer session where the panelists will address the questions submitted by the audience. Today we have two outstanding panelists to discuss our topic, Akira Amoto, who is the project professor for the Department of Nuclear Engineering and Management at the University of Tokyo, and Charles Forsberg, who is director and principal investigator for the MIT Fluoride Salt Pool High Temperature Reactor Project and the Idaho National Laboratory University led for hybrid energy systems. And with those introductions, I would like to welcome our representatives from Japan's Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry to start the webinar. Uh, thank you, colleagues. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Takehiro from Japan, uh, one of the Japanese colleagues of Nice to Future Initiative. And uh, uh, thank you for your participation today. Uh, I'm very happy, happy about that. And I'd like to very shortly introduce the concept of this initiative and this webinar. Uh, nice to Future Initiative is founded under uh, Clean Energy Ministry uh, this year. And the concept is a good harmonization in my understanding of nuclear energy and renewable energy. And uh, there are some uh, very, a lot of uh, challenges between the two energies uh, of, uh, of the harmonization. And today we have a very interesting joint study from Japan and the United States addressing these uh, issues and challenges. So uh, please, find your uh, some new understanding uh, from this webinar. Thank you. Uh, and, and now we're ready to just go to the panel's presentations. I believe Dr. Amoto will be speaking first. And so Dr. Amoto, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, could you go to the first slide, uh, slide zero? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for kind introduction and thank you for this opportunity. A little bit uh, uh, correction. I used to be working for the University of Tokyo, but currently working for Tokyo Institute of Technology. Uh, I'm speaking from Tokyo, where it is very sunny. I cannot see any cloud in the sky with a temperature hovering around 15 to 20 degrees Celsius or around 50 degrees Fahrenheit. On a sunny day like this in spring or autumn, uh, solar accounts for more than 70% of electricity supply in Kyushu Island with more than 10 gigawatt grid. This island is one of the uh, four major islands in Japan, and this happens during the daytime or weekends. Uh, there, as the left side photo shows, abandoned golf courses are converted to solar power stations. Like that, we see a significant increase of solar or wind power, uh, which often 
causes electricity price collapse and even negative price in some part of the world. Often, uh, nuclear energy and renewables are considered as in conflict with each other. However, both are important for supply of low carbon energy. So how can we use nuclear and non-dispatchable solar and wind power in a complementary manner in order to achieve decarbonization at a minimum cost burden to the society? This is a focal point of this, our discussion today. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the outline of our discussion today and is uh, primarily based on the joint study by MIT and Japan. After a brief introduction, we will discuss what is required in the grid when intermittent renewables penetrate deeply and what is possible what is possible for integration of nuclear and intermittent renewable in low carbon society. Next slide, please. Uh, first of all, let me discuss economics of solar and window. According to OECD IEA, solar becomes the cheapest source of electricity generation in many places in the world, including China and India. Uh, Comparison of unsubsidized leveraged cost of electricity by Razard shown on this slide illustrates photovoltaic and window are cheaper than nuclear for new build. However, of course, this does not include social or environmental externalities, nor intermittency related costs such as battery, backup power, or grid stabilization. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this figure is a hypothetical road curve in Germany in 2030. Uh, it depicts that in marginal cost basis kilowatt hour market, intermittent renewables penetrate deep and threaten base load power generating source such as coal or nuclear. Although this figure does not reflect reality, uh, it is still valid in a generic sense and visualize the economic difficulty faced by nuclear power plants due to reduced amount of kilowatt hour they produce. Uh, electricity price collapses when the share of non-dispatchable power generation sources is high. Prices often go negative in US due to production tax credit uh, given to intermittent renewables. Uh, now I would like to hand over to Charles. Could we have the next slide? I'm, at, I'm in Boston, of course, which it's at night, and we'll need to click the slide one more time to show the picture. The central problem, or central challenge, I should say, with the renewables, non-dispatch renewables, is price collapse. What this figure shows is the wholesale price of electricity on the vertical axis and the time an hour per or time over 24 hours of one day in California. The red line shows what the wholesale price was in 2012. The blue line shows what the price was in 2017. What happened in these five years was the installation of very large quantities of photovoltaic, which on weekends and other times of high solar input, collapsed the price of electricity until it was negative in the middle of the day. At the same time, the price of electricity increased slightly before sunrise and after sunset. Now, obviously, this type of price structure is very disadvantageous for wind, nuclear, and solar. Nobody can pay for an electricity system with negative revenue. And so what it requires is large subsidies for wind and solar to address the price collapse. At the same time, you have these peaks after, before and after sunset when other power stations have to come on very quickly and uh, produce power when the sun goes down. In short, there's a challenge that must be addressed because of the non-dispatchability of wind and solar. Could I have the next slide? 
solar revenue collapses as uh, we accelerate solar output. This is uh, some figures from the MIT Future of Solar Energy study. And the red line shows average price mar market prices as you add solar. And the blue line shows the price, uh, the revenue, price or revenue for PV as you add more solar. And the solar penetration increases from about 6% to 36%. And of course, what is happening in the middle of the day when you have excess electricity, the price goes down and the revenue collapses at the same time. I may mean, have the next slide, you can see the consequences of this on a system-wide scale. Uh, this shows the uh, percentage of electricity from PV in many different countries as a function of time. Italy, Greece, Germany, Japan, and Spain. And what we see in each of these countries is that initially as solar is uh, installed, it contributes widely, have, widely to the grid's power production, and the percentage of electricity from solar goes up very rapidly. But it levels off, and it levels off typically around 8% in Europe, because if you have a lot of solar in the middle of the day, adding additional solar in the middle of the day does not contribute additional electricity to the grid. You just have to shut down uh, parts of your power production system. And so the question we will be addressing today is how to reduce that kind of challenge for wind, nuclear, and solar. Could I have the next slide? Now, MIT did a, an analysis of different power systems to determine what the effect was of, a, of different systems. One system, uh, which is shown in the top figure, is we have had all energy sources, uh, nuclear, wind, solar, coal, coal with sequestration, and we asked what would be the cost of electricity if you had a totally optimized system. Optimized in this case is minimizing the average cost of electricity to the customer. So the top slide is all sources of electricity. The bottom figure is all sources of electricity without carbon dioxide. Without without nuclear, and as you see, if you take out nu nuclear, the price of electricity goes up. Now, what we've done is analysis for six different parts of the world, uh, from left to right: Texas, New England, Beijing, another area of China, the United Kingdom, and France. So we have six different uh, electricity grids for with all energy sources and with uh, without nuclear. And as we can see in each of the cases. As you go to less and less uh, or less and less CO2 emissions, in other words, from left to right, from the blue, orange, gray, yellow, dark blue lines, less and less CO2, prices go up. But if you don't have nuclear, the prices go up more. And the problem, of course, is the non-dispatchability of renewables. The challenge of, of providing electricity when you do not have wind and when you do not have solar. And that's the challenge of nuclear. That's that's a challenge for renewables. And the question is, how do you integrate the two systems together to minimize the total costs to society? And I'll pass this back to uh, Professor Omoto. Thank you. Uh, now let us look at the data. Uh, uh, the go, could you go to the next slide? Uh, the mere increase of the share of solar or wind power does not necessarily lead to greenhouse gas emission reduction nor affordable price. This table shows both um, gram CO2 per kilowatt hour and cent per kilowatt hour are high in countries trying hard to increase the share of wind, whereas countries like France or Sweden with high share of dispatchable clean electricity, namely nuclear and hydro, shows better performance in this context. I think generally speaking, the difference arises from a uh, coal power generation portfolio and methods such as backup power to deal with renewables intermittency. For your information, the target of UK Climate Change Committee is 50 gram CO2 per kilowatt hour, and MIT's recent report published in September says around 10 to 25 gram CO2 per kilowatt hour is required for two degrees C scenario. 
the global, globally, the current average is around 500 CO2 per kilowatt hour. Japan is 540. Uh, the pie chart here shows that in US, nuclear accounts for 60% of clean electricity followed by renewables. Globally, uh, nuclear power accounts for one third of clean uh, carbon free electricity. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, against this background, researchers at MIT and Japan, Tokyo Institute of Te Technology, University of Tokyo, and so on, started working in 2015 on these four topics as shown here. They range from cost of decarbonization, how nuclear can contribute to tackle the issue created by intermittency, as well as technological and institutional innovations. Uh, can I move to the next slide? Um, next slide, please. Um, as the share of intermittent renewables increases, the power system uh, requires flexibility by three methods. One is the flexible generation, including load following operation of base load power, curtailment of excess power from renewable, uh, I mean the curtailment, uh, cut off the connection to the grid. Second is storage or hybrid production to trim mismatch in demand and supply. Third is smart grid management, such as virtual power plant or peer-to-peer -peer transaction among prosumers. And of course, supporting policy tools help their implementation. Uh, going to the next slide. Uh, the very often, nuclear energy and renewables are considered as conflicting with each other. Nuclear side may say feed, feed in tariff or production tax credit for solar and wind are distorting market. Renewable side may say nuclear destroys environment. However, both nuclear and intermittent renewables do not emit greenhouse gas in the process of power generation both increase domestic energy supply and both are capital intensive, meaning a high capacity factor is required for economics. Nuclear and intermittent renewables can complement each other rather than fighting each other. I think the role of nuclear energy for decarbonization, uh, first of all, supply of affordable clean energy, not only to power market, but also to transportation and industry sector. Second, helping intermittent renewables to address adequacy issues in terms of kilowatt and delta kilowatt. I will be talking about this a little bit later. Thirdly, power supply to uh, negative emission technologies and so forth. To elaborate a little bit more on adequacy issue, adequacy of power system to ensure reliable supply, reliable supply can be measured by kilowatt value, kilowatt hour value, and adjustment capability to changing kilowatt. As is shown on this table, intermittent renewables can compete in the market under merit order of marginal cost. However, they have problems in adequacy of power system because of their availability, depends on weather condition. There are clear differences between nuclear and intermittent renewable in adequacy measures of kilowatt and delta kilowatt, as is shown here. Battery storage and complementary use with nuclear or thermal plants support intermittent renewables in delta kilowatt values. We will explain this in more detail in the next section. Uh, go to the next slide. Um, to enable complementary use of nuclear and in intermittent renewables, we need innovation in technology and institutional tools. This section discuss such innovations. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, let us discuss three examples of complementary use. 
The first example shown here is thermal storage, which is possible for light water reactor retrofit by installing steam generator and oversized turbine generator. Operational modality is that uh, when enough electricity is supplied from solar or window, light water reactor may store partial heat without changing thermal power in the core. Then use stored heat for electricity generation when sun or window is weak. In this way, nuclear power plant becomes not only an enabler of electricity production of intermittent renewables, but also becomes more profitable since nuclear power plant decreases electricity production when its market price is low, but produces more when the price is high. Uh, I would like to hand over to uh, Charles. Okay, thank you. May we have the next slide? The next couple of slides are going to go into the technology of why you want to couple heat storage with nuclear reactors to enable the integration of nuclear and renewables. As everybody knows, if you can store energy in the form of electricity, batteries, hydro, and other technologies, or you can store uh, energy in the form of heat. Now, the reason we are interested in heat storage is it's cheaper than electricity storage. There have been many recent studies that have estimated electricity storage costs, uh, that is using batteries, pumped hydro, and other technologies at the terawatt scale, and the typical costs come out around $340, $350 per kilowatt hour. At those electricity storage costs, one is talking about doubling or tripling the cost of electricity. Now in the United States, the US Department of Energy has a goal for electricity battery storage of $150 a kilowatt. This is for the battery only. If you add the electronics, the costs are roughly doubled to the area or the neighborhood of about $300 per kilowatt. DOE also has a heat storage goal. This is primarily associated with concentrated solar power systems and that goal is $15 a kilowatt hour, an order of magnitude less. And that goal has been achieved at some solar power stations. Because of the low cost of heat storage relative to electricity storage, we now have solar power plants, solar thermal power plants with heat storage, whereas photovoltaic systems do not because the electricity storage technologies are more expensive. Could we turn to the next slide? The next slide uh, shows the cost of different energy storage technologies, starting with sensible heat at the very top and going down through a wide variety of technologies with the cost on the horizontal axis. And what one finds out is that the sensible heat storage technologies as deployed are substantially cheaper than other technologies. And that's, of course, actually been demonstrated in the field as well as with mathematical calculations. Could we have the next slide? The next slide shows heat storage that enables a baseload reactor with variable electricity output. In the upper left-hand corner, we have the reactor. It operates at base load, a constant production of steam. It sends a variable amount of steam to the power cycle. All of the steam to the power cycle if there's a high demand, but if there's a low demand, the reactor sends some of its steam downward to the heat storage system. So it's the reactor, steady state, variable steam to the power cycle and to heat storage. When the demand for electricity is high, that is the price is high, the reactor sends all of its power, all of its steam to the power cycle and steam from heat storage goes to the addition, goes to the power cycle as shown by the arrow on the far right. So what we have here is a reactor at steady state with variable electricity to the grid. There is, however, one other feature with heat storage. If there are times of very low electricity prices or negative prices, we can take that electricity from the grid and use it to provide heat storage in our heat storage system. And what this does is it provides a market that provides a minimum price for electricity and it eliminates negative priced electricity by dumping the excess electricity into heat storage. 
So what we have here is a system that provides electricity to the grid when the price is high and the demand is high, but can also absorb electricity from the grid and dump it into heat storage when the price is low. That characteristic, of course, greatly improves the economics of nuclear power, but it also improves the economics of wind and solar because there is a market of last resort, a market that will take very low priced electricity and dump it into heat storage and thus raise the minimum price of electricity above zero. Could I have the next slide? Now there are many heat storage technologies that couple, can couple to light water reactors and can produce peak power. Two of these technologies, steam accumulators and sensible heat are commercially deployed on large solar, concentrated solar power systems. Four other technologies are in various states of development, research and development. This is not a comprehensive list. People have, have been working on many new concepts as the market has changed, and there are probably six or seven other concepts that are not shown in this picture. I'm going to describe one heat storage technology, if I may have the next slide, and that is steam accumulators. This is the oldest storage technology for heat for the production of electricity. And of course, again, the target goal is $15 a kilowatt hour. Now, we show a picture here of a steam accumulator on the right. And what the steam accumulator, steam accumulator does is when the price of electricity is low, steam from the reactor is used to heat the hot water to high pressure and high temperature. And the heat storage capability is typically 20 to 40 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. When the price of electricity is uh, high, the pressure relief valve is opened and hot steam goes to the turbine to produce electricity. Could I have the next slide? That describes the technology of steam accumulators. The first steam accumulator that was put on the electric grid was the Charlenburg Power Station in Berlin. It was installed in 1929. It was a, the power source to charge it was coal to produce steam in the middle of the night, to produce peak electricity in the middle of the day, roughly 50 megawatts with a separate turbine. <clears throat> so that's the technology of 1929. On the right, we show the technology of 2017. This happens to be the key solar uh, power plant in S South Africa, which has steam accumulators. You see the solar concentrated solar power plant on the top, and you see at the base of it the steam accumulators, which are large tanks, and below pictures of large tanks. So this is the oldest technology, but it's only one of several technologies that are also applicable to light water reactors. In general, the technologies used by concentrated solar systems and the technologies used by light water reactors are similar and in many cases identical because they have an identical goal, the storage of heat at times of excess production to produce steam at other times. With that description of heat storage, I will pass the baton back to Professor Omoto. Thank you. Um, another example of complementary use is nuclear hydro, hy hybrid production to produce process heat or energy carrier such as hydrogen for transportation. By using excess thermal power from a nuclear reactor when, when the sun or window is supplying enough electricity, it can be converted to uh, uh, produce energy carrier, for example, hydrogen. A uh, nuclear power plant does not necessarily have to limit itself to power generation, but it can produce uh, supply heat to local industry and also produce energy carrier uh, for uh, such as hydrogen for transportation. Um, for this, high temperature reactor is necessary. Light water reactor is not supplying uh, high enough temperature. Uh, switching products between electricity and other products can be done while reactor thermal power is kept constant. Japan Atomic Energy Authority, JAEA, has 30 megawatt thermal high temperature gas cooled reactor. 
This is, a exper this is an experimental reactor that was operated at 950 degrees Celsius. Uh, Celsius. Separately, JEA has demonstrated hydrogen production by splitting water using thermochemical reaction on laboratory scale. In the future, I expect tests are done for automatic response using control and bypass valves in order to switch products between electricity and hydrogen following grid demand change. The picture here is not that of HDTL, but it depicts a model gas turbine high temperature reactor for cogeneration of electricity and hydrogen. Next slide, please. I think hydrogen is a leading candidate for a hybrid energy system to give us sufficient impact. Uh, some prerequisites exist. First of all, massive demand, such as for cars. Secondly, electricity must be uh, by a large fraction of total production costs so as to afford to operate for hybrid production at part load. Thirdly, product must be storable, like natural gas. Uh, at this stage, it is not clear whether there is any other co-product at a scale to make a real difference. One of the part of the, on the part of the renewables, power to gas project exists to produce hydrogen from surplus electricity from window by splitting water. Next slide, please. Um, hybrid production includes supply of high temperature steam as it process heat to industry. Uh, this figure shows candidates, uh, but uh, you will see the industry requires heat higher than 300 degrees Celsius as a whole. Existing light water reactor cannot supply such high temperature. I think this cross-sectorial sectorial integration by complementary use of is an important uh, contemporary driver to advance reactor technologies to high temperature. Such reactors are high temperature gas cooled reactor, sodium cooled first reactor, and molten salt reactor. Uh, so Professor Forsberg, please. Yes, could we have the next slide? I'd like to stand back a little further and take a look at the broader perspective, the integration of nuclear and intermittent renewable systems. What we're talking about is flexible production of electricity, industrial heat, desalination of water and other products. And the goal, of course, is the same goal in all cases. We want to be able to fully utilize all of the energy produced by nuclear, wind and solar. These are high capital cost, low operating cost technologies. If you operate them at half capacity, you double the cost of energy. And for that reason, we need to operate all of these technologies at full load, maximum capacity. Of course, what that means is we have to design a system that can take the variable output of this and produce electricity as needed for the electricity grid, but also find ways and methods to use excess energy when it's available, either dump it into storage or send it to industry or some combination. So we have to think about the whole system, recognizing that in addition to storage, we have the option of dumping thermal energy and electricity into the, into the industrial sector in the form of heat, with heat storage, and we have the option of a variety of electricity storage technologies, including electric thermal storage technologies. So it's important to think about the system as a whole, recognizing we can also dump excess energy into the industrial sector uh, when we have excess production from these sources. Of course, we do need to think about co-location and the management of the entire system by a signal entity. So there's a coordination activity that is required to make efficient use of these expensive generating technologies in the sense that they're capital intensive, and low cost production of energy only happens if we fully utilize them. Could I have the next slide? 
Now, there are a couple of, couple of institutional issues that need to be addressed. First, we need to reduce price collapse by avoiding mechanisms such as production tax credit that subsidize excess electricity production when it's not needed. Negative priced electricity is not a good idea. It's not good for wind. It's not good for solar. It's not good for society. So we need to have our incentives for efficient use of all electricity and not do some crazy things to the market. The second, we need greenhouse emissions reduction policies by changing the policy tools to support all low carbon energy sources equally, nuclear, wind, and solar. And it'll work out what quantities of nuclear, wind, and solar will change depending upon, of course, location and uh, local resource availability of the renewables. Third, we need to enable high capacity factors for capital intensive generating facilities. This includes, of course, grid upgrades to reduce containments of renewable energy sources and incentives for all types of storage, including heat storage. Last, we need in, in, to enable flexibility in resource management, smart grids, demand side management, and a variety of other technologies that can efficiently use the energy when it is available. Could I have the last slide? Could I have the next slide? Okay, there it is. Takeaway message. A shared goal by nuclear and intermittent renewables achieving a high level of decarbonization at minimum cost to society. We emphasize the cost factor because the problem is, is that if it's if very if energy doubles or becomes much more expensive it becomes a very large social burden to society because energy is six to eight percent of the gross national product. The methods are we can use complementary use of nuclear and renewable systems for flexibility. This includes flexible generation, storage or hybrid systems, and smart grid management. Now what is noteworthy about these different technologies is there was no incentive to deploy these when you have fossil fuels. When you have a fossil fuel system, the answer is if you need less electricity, don't burn as much of the coal, oil, or natural gas. So it's an efficient way of operating it. But that is not true with nuclear, wind, and renewables. So we need a new set of technologies that appropriately integrate these technologies together to minimize cost. And that brings us to our third conclusion, the need for technology and institutional innovations and a joint roadmap for nuclear and intermittent renewables in option space that would uh, that would provide real help on the path going forward. Uh, with that, I think we can open up the uh, the discussion to the to the uh, to the viewers and see if they have any questions. And I'll turn this over to the moderator, who will select which questions should be answered and which which uh, people are called up on first. Thank you so much, Dr. Emoto and Dr. Forsberg. We really appreciate that. That was an excellent overview, and we are we are uh, loving it. Um, we want to remind everyone to go ahead and submit your questions. We have a few audience questions, but we'll probably have time for a few more. So feel free to keep submitting questions, and we'll we'll get to them as best we can. If we do not have time to get to all of the questions, then we will also follow up with the presenters, and hopefully, if they have time, we'll answer them and get them back to the people who ask them. Um, so with our questions, we had a couple of different categories of questions, and so I'm going to try to group them together and do my best on that. The first one was uh, actually interesting about, um, for people who have, from someone who seems to have read the study, about a carbon price. Um, how do things like a carbon price factor into your analysis of uh, what is the lowest price op option to decarbonization? In the United States, I don't think we have a carbon price. Um, Japan, Dr. Omoto, I guess we'll ask you first. Is there a carbon price in Japan? Well, in fact, there is no direct carbon tax. Uh, however, the indirectly, there is a carbon tax through the, uh, direct, uh, trans in the transportation system, for example. Thank you. And to either of you, Dr. Forsberg or Dr. Omoto, how does the carbon tax affect some of your calculations, or how did it factor into your analysis in the report? Uh, let, me answer, let me answer this. The, we, have, we have a challenge here. We're changing the system, an energy system based on fossil fuels to a low carbon society. 
neither you nor I nor anybody else has a good feel of what the right sex selection of technologies will be to minimize cost. The thing about a carbon tax is it's a way to f force people off of carbon we allow the market to figure out the lowest cost solution. And we support a carbon tax because of our concern about the cost structure of getting off of carbon. If it's too expensive, the penalties to society will be too large. In effect, we will not get off of carbon. So it's important to find the most efficient pathway to get off of carbon, recognizing our ignorance and the strategy to do that which most economists support, is a carbon tax and let the market figure out what technologies, what combination of technologies work the best. Thank you so much. And in a similar question to that, uh, some people were discussing or asking about carbon capture. We didn't see a lot of carbon capture in your presentation. Does carbon capture have a role to play in any of this? And if so, what prices, where, where does it possibly get modeled at that it becomes cost effective to implement? Um, uh, I, this is Charles. I'll let Professor Omoto answer that first. <laughs> okay. Um, I think in order to achieve the target of restricting warming to within two degrees Celsius uh, to of pre-industrial level, they require energy saving and increase of the uh, clean energy. However, such measures may fail. For example, the saving. In such cases, not only reduce the emission, but the removal of generated CO2 by such means as forestation, direct air capture, and carbon storage, and the use of bus biomass with carbon capture and storage may need to be implemented. As, I'm, as I had explained in my, in my presentation, uh, the, the nuclear will be able to assist uh, by supplying power to negative emission technologies. Uh, for example, forestation requires watering, reverse osmosis to produce potable water and its transportation by pump. And ducts, uh, direct air capture, the energy cost of direct air capture would be in the range of, uh, of the 1500 or 2300 uh, which is uh, $420 or $630 per ton CO2 or greater, according to some information available on web. So the uh, supplying cheap electricity from nuclear for to assist uh, negative emission technologies will be maybe a part of the duty of the nuclear energy in the future. Charles? I, I don't think I have anything to, to add to that. Thank you very much for that. We got some questions also about negative emission technology. Did you want to have anything else you want to say on what negative emission technology is? Um, you mentioned it there, but I don't think it was explained in the presentation. Um, uh, Professor Omoto, I'll let you answer that. Yes. Uh, the Negative emission technologies are basically to uh, remove CO2 in the air by various means, as I mentioned before, forestation or direct air capture, and the use of biomass with carbon capture and storage. These technologies are being developed very rapidly, and there is some experimental scale facilities uh, there, here and there. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so now kind of switching gears a little bit, we had some questions about the design of these hybrid plants. Specifically, uh, the first one that came up was about hydrogen. So nuclear reactors are, are often very big. Um, how flexible is something like a hydrogen pr production process? How quickly could it ramp and how flexible is it to accommodating changes in grid electricity? Well, in fact, there is uh, no uh, testing done yet by using a real high temperature gas cool reactor, but uh, the researchers at the JEA, JAEA, Japan Atomic Energy Authority, are working uh, on these topics. And uh, basically, the, the control is done by use of the uh, control valve and bypass valves 
in a way to channel to turbine generator, uh, channel heat to turbine generator or to hydrogen production uh, the facilities. And hope, I hope that in the future by using HTTR, uh, the testing will be done uh, to, in, to prove that such a control is possible. Unfortunately, in the aftermath of 3.11, I mean 20, uh, the earthquake and tsunami in 2011, uh, the HTTR is currently idle and hopefully will restart sometime in autumn next year. So at that time, hopefully such an uh, automatic response using control and bypass valves will be uh, done. Awesome, thank you. And actually there was kind of a follow-up question for that. Um, in some of the designs in the report, it looked like there was an intermediate heat storage that was used as a buffer. Is that always necessary if you have a variable output that quickly ramps on its hydrogen production, or can you, or can you do it without an intermediate heat storage? Well, to my knowledge, the um, the automatic response using control valve and uh, bypass valves in HTT or high temperature gas cool reactor will not need uh, some supplementary steam accumulator or some heat storage. Uh, but uh, this will be discussed further by uh, after the, the uh, experimental testing using HTTR, I think. Awesome, thank you. Um, and so we're gonna switch gears again because we had a lot of questions come in about some of the costs of storage. But just in case people uh, didn't or weren't quite aware, please feel free to submit your questions at any time. We are still taking them. And we will, of course, always try to follow up if possible with our presenters. So changing uh, kind of directions a little bit, uh, and in that uh, subject of storage, um, one of the things that was noticed by presenters is there wasn't a lot of talk of pumped hydrogen storage or pumped hydroelectric storage, things like pumped water storage. Uh, do you have any research with that or what the costs are and how that plays into decarbonization? Uh, this is Charles Forsberg. The central question here is the availability of appropriate sites, which depends very much on the country you're in. If you're in Norway, no problem. If you're in the central United States, no hills. So the availability of that option is very, very site specific, and that's why it received less attention than other kinds of storage technologies. It's you know it's great if you happen to have the right amount of rainfall and the right mountains, but otherwise, it's just not an option. Um, Thank you very much. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Emoto. Did you have something you uh, wanted to say? Yes. Uh, let me supplement by saying that pump storage is uh, very widely done in Japan. Uh, the, actually, the, um, in, in most uh, utility companies in Japan, they have pump storage capacity. Uh, however, the, um, the further expansion of this pump storage capacity will not be easy because of the environmental concern. Um, the, I have touched a little bit about the possible curtailment of the uh, excess electricity from solar or window. Uh, actually, in, in Japan, in Kyushu Island, as I had mentioned uh, on the early, in the beginning of my uh, speech, the curtailment of the solar electricity is uh, one of the biggest concerns, but which is a reality and will be done every weekend during the uh, springtime or the autumn. But uh, cut before curtailment, there is a prerequisite. One is the thermal power station will be minimized. The power generation by thermal power will be minimized. And second prerequisite, thermal storage is uh, implemented as much as possible. And if these two does not uh, satisfy, the, does not still uh, the, uh, uh, satisfy the condition, then curtailment of the uh, electricity production, uh, electricity connection to the connection to the uh, grid uh, from solar is implemented. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Moto. Um, and so, as kind of one more follow-up to the storage question, 
Um, what were some of the costs that you projected batteries to go down to? I know we, you talked a little about projecting the price of batteries over time. What were some of the prices estimated by this study uh, over, bat over time for battery storage? Uh, we, we used, we used uh, the, what we did is we looked at what's in the literature with people who've spent a great deal more time than we have at looking at battery storage. And uh, they've looked at a wide variety of systems and they end up around $300, $350 a kilowatt hour. Um, the reasons are actually quite important to understand. When you make anything, the cost of that production depends upon the cost of raw materials. One of the reasons solar pole photovoltaics has gone down is that the raw material is silicon, which is made, makes up much of the Earth's crust. Batteries, or at least the batteries that people are considering, have expensive materials such as lithium and cobalt. And, and if you start with an expensive material, you end up with an expensive product. This is why gold bracelets cost more than steel bracelets. And the problem is, is not a technology problem. The problem is, is this cost of raw materials. And batteries are intrinsically high cost, have high cost starting materials, whereas heat storage intrinsically has very low cost storage, very low cost raw materials. So this all comes back to the cost of the raw materials that go into your storage technology. And it is, that is why heat storage is so much cheaper than the electrical storage technologies. You know, even if you have technological advances, the fundamental cost structure will be ultimately determined by what is the cost of raw materials. And cheap raw materials starting points, cheap products, expensive raw materials starting point, expensive products. Thank you very much. Um, as a follow-up question to that, uh, one participant asked, or one attendee asked, uh, how many times a year does thermal energy storage have to cycle to make it cost effective? I know you put in the presentation around $15 per kilowatt hour. Um, is that, what, what does that correlate to in terms of discharge cycle? Well, well the, 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 the cost structure is about a factor of 10 less. So, it, you know, it depends on the, mar it depends on the market, market you're in. But obviously, you need far fewer cycles. You may need only a fourth or a fifth as many cycles as you will with electricity storage. And it, you know, it all goes back to the cost of raw materials in the system. If you have very expensive materials, you just have to have a lot of cycles per year. And if you don't have a lot of cycles per year, it becomes prohibitive, prohibitively expensive. Thank you. Um, and in that uh, subject, I guess I'm not sure if it's classified as always storage or the different process. But one attendee wanted to know about other types of chemical processes that could be used from nuclear. They mentioned uh, making synthetic gasoline, diesel, or aviation fuel with heat from the reactor. Um, is this being looked at or not looked at? And if so, uh, why? There is a lot of work looking at different hybrid systems, energy systems. Uh, of course, the big markets, the really large markets in this area, are ones that produce transport fuels. And the logical transport, the transport fuels that people are looking at are first, A, hydrogen, and second, biofuels. Now, it turns out in the biofuels production, it require a lot of heat. So if you have uh, nuclear heat available, you have a lower cost of the production of converting biomass into biofuels. But the big markets, simply because that's where the energy is, are the transport markets. And of course, there's a competition here between uh, people who are pushing the production of hydrogen as a transport fuel versus biofuels versus ammonia versus other technologies. But clearly, the place that uh, nuclear energy will play in that world in terms of large-scale chemicals are the ones that are used in the transport sector. Thank you so much. Um, so we have kind of one more question in the technical realm, kind of cost realm. And uh, one participant was wondering, what are some of the overnight costs you assumed in the United States and in Japan for nuclear reactors to produce these estimates? In, in the, M, in the M, MIT uh, Future of Nuclear Power Study, it was $5,500 per, uh, per kilowatt. Uh, we'd, uh, I'm not sure what it was in the other countries. I don't remember it. I just remember the US number it was $5,500 per kilowatt. Uh, of course, what's some, when you do these optimization studies of, 
of what is the optimum system. You, you try different numbers. And what you find out in all cases is the low cost option is some combination of nuclear wind and solar. What happens if, if you have the cost of nuclear goes down, there's more nuclear. If there's cost less uh, cost goes up, you have less nuclear. But the economic optimizations always shows a combination of those because a long term long term energy storage is more expensive than having nuclear in the in the mix. So you know the relative cost effect, the ratio of what you use it doesn't affect the fact that you have all of the technologies in the mix. All of the technologies generally minimize the cost. Um, uh, Akira would like to respond, su supplement a little bit. Uh, the the uh, invest overnight investment cost for new nuclear build, uh, <laughs> the, there is no exact data right now, although Japan has three nuclear power plants under construction, but was uh, these are the units which suspended construction by uh, 3-11 disaster in 2011. Uh, so when Japan start new construction sometime in the future, the real data will come in. But uh, I think the, the like uh, other countries, uh, 5,000 or 600 dollar per kilowatt might be conceivable. But uh, in the case of Europe and the States, uh, they are constructing first of a kind plant like AP1000 or EPR after the uh, the experience of construction has been exhausted they were 20 or 30 years ago. So by coupling by coupled by these two effects, the uh, the cost of the uh, new investment will be has been increased significantly. And however, the situation will be a little bit different if the country continues uh, construction of the plants uh, continuously, like the case of the Korea. So the, uh, I cannot generalize the overnight uh, cost. It depends on country's specifics, especially uh, if the country has a continued nuclear energy deployment program or not. Thank you very much. Uh, that was an excellent answer. Um, and so we are running out of time. So I think we'll ask one more question and then we'll give our presenters time to have any wrap up statements they might want to add. So our final question of the night is, uh, what do you think the nice future could or should do to advance these nuclear renewable systems? This is, a, this is after all, a nice future initiative uh, webinar. And so what do you think the nice future could do uh, for these type of systems to, to be advanced in both Japan and the United States and in other countries? Well, I okay. think, yeah, go ahead. I'll let Professor Omoto, um, Professor, Professor Omoto start on the, on the discussion. Okay, uh, I think what's important is uh, to think about what the government can do to accelerate uh, the, the such things like a complementary use. Uh, as a part of the Nice Future Initiative. In that context, uh, I think two things are conceivable. One is to create joint roadmap by nuclear side and intermittent renewable and provide funding for R&D. Uh, since there are commonalities in needed technology, such as storage and hybrid production. This is already mentioned as the last part of uh, Professor Forsberg's presentation. And secondly, to give credit to assure the capacity and the, cap and the capability to adjust the demand change in the market in order to incentivize actions for storage and hybrid hybrid production so Charles I think I would I would I would concur with that with an emphasis on the on the observation that we're getting off of carbon as, as, as a fuel, a fuel where we can store easily and, and which we've used for roughly 300,000 years as we've gone from the camping fire to the gas turbine. And so we're heading into a, a future with a totally different set of energy options. And what there is is a need to explore that option space and lay out some roadmaps, recognizing that we have a lot of things we don't know. And it's just going to take time to sort out that option space. But we don't have a lot of time because of the, of the greenhouse gas concerns. So it's time to, you know, really take a serious look at how you put all the pieces together in a way that minimizes the total cost to society. 
because if we do not keep those costs under control, it will be very difficult to get off of carbon if, if it results in a significant decrease in the standard of living. So it, in the end of the day, this is much about economics as it is about technology, because if we can't get the economics right, uh, there's going to be a, we're going to keep on burning fossil fuels. That That is the, the reality. You know, countries don't burn coal because they like coal. They burn coal because it's cheap and it, it, they need it to maintain their standard of living. So I think it's important to get started and to push hard to figure out how all of these new pieces that previously weren't working together should work together to minimize total costs. That was, seems like an excellent statement to end on. Um, we are out of time. So first off, I want to say thank you so much to everyone who presented. Our presenters were awesome. Thank you so much for all of our attendees as well. If there are any questions that we do not get to, we will follow up and we will get those back to you. Um, and for now, just thank you everyone for attending and have a good evening or morning. Thank you.